morning. It is 10 a.m. Central Standard Time, March 31st, 2021. We're located at the Dallas Independent School District STEM Environmental Education Center. And we want to say a very special welcome to Rosemont for joining us this morning on this going to be a beautiful day. If you're watching teachers and you're not signed up, please do so. Go to www.tiny.cc slash EEC register and fill out the little chart form. It's for our attendance records only. Uh, today, we're gonna to do a program called Plate Tectonics. During this virtual field trip, students will explore plate tectonics. Students will identify the major tectonic plates and describe how plate tectonics causes major geol uh, geological events such as ocean basin formation, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, and mount, mountain building. Excuse me. Mr. Monroe will introduce you to plate tectonics. Ms. Ramirez will cover earthquakes. Ms. Nash will talk about volcanoes. And Ms. Fuller will do mountain building. You cannot verbally ask us questions, but you can do www.tiny.cc slash EEC uh, space question space answer and uh, send us questions. We'll do my best to answer them during the program. And if not, I'll send the answers to your teachers. Uh, now I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we're gonna turn the program over to Mr. Monroe to introduce you to plate tectonics. Good morning, students. My name is Mr. Monroe and we're going to be looking at plate tectonics. You know, plate tectonics started out as a theory. When we talk about a theory, we're talking about a group of linked ideas intended to explain something or why something has happened. Oh, I guess you would say it's a guess or a speculation. And it doesn't really become a true fact until you get enough evidence that supports it. And we know that plate tectonics started out as a theory. And it started out by a gentleman coming up with the theory of plate tectonics by the name of Alfred Wagner. And he came up with this theory in 1910. Now, a lot of people didn't believe what he was saying simply because there were certain bits of evidence or certain facts that he was missing. And the fact that really supported that that was a true fact about plate, plate tectonics didn't come until after Wagner had died. So he really didn't get that part. And we're going to be looking at that. So to look at that, I'm going to be sharing a short, a short PowerPoint with you all. So I'm going to share my screen as we look at some of the evidence that supports plate tectonics. Bear with me just for a few minutes. Plate tectonic, a theory. Well, it's not a theory today. You know, plate tectonics started out as a theory. And this theory was that the lithosphere is divided into tectonic plates that slowly move on the top of the asthenosphere. Cool, rigid, and the outermost layer of the earth that is divided into enormous pieces called tectonic plates consist of the crust and the rigid uppermost part of the mantle. And if we look at this, we can see the structure of our planet. Here we have the crust. Just beneath the crust, we have the stenosphere. And then below that is the mantle. Convection currents. You know, material in the mantle cools, contracts, and becomes more dense and sinks. Material heats, expands, and it becomes less dense, so it begins to rise. A clinical motion occurs because of density differences in the mantle. Heated, less dense lower regions again, regions again cause the mantle to rise, and denser, cooler regions sink due to gravity. The combined motions serve as an engine 
for most crustal plates to for move, crustal plate movement. And this is the mechanism that Wagner didn't know about that would really support his theory to become a fact. The theory that the continents were once connected but drifted apart is called continental drift. We can see here the way during the Permian period that uh, all land masses were joined together as in a supercontinent called Pangaea. Now, it's hard to imagine that at one time, millions of years ago, all of our land masses were like that. And as time passed, the land masses began to pull apart during the Triassic period, then the Jurassic period. And most people get all excited about that period because we know that was the period of the age of the reptile, the dinosaurs. And then we moved into the Cretaceous period 65 million years ago. And here we are the present day. The mineralized remains of organisms shown how long dead organisms live and how their bodies were structured. In other words, we're talking about fossils. Significant climate change indicated by fossils found in Antarctica suggests the continents was once much closer to the equator. We can see how all of that, Wegener's thing was that all of it fit together like a big jigsaw puzzle. One, one other bit of evidence was the evidence of seafloor spreading, a parallel pattern of rock material found at the identical locations on each side of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge reveals rock of the same geological age and polarity. Divergent boundaries. Divergent boundaries occur when two tectonic plates move away from each other as seen in this image. They're moving away. Right here, there's an arrow showing this direction and this direction. And of course, the Great Rift uh, Valley of Africa is shown here, okay? Convergent boundaries are uh, 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 with what we call subduction. Now, the boundary between two tectonic plates moving toward each other, resulting in volcanic activity, which you'll learn a little bit about that a little later on. When a denser, denser ocean plate subducts or moves below a continental plate or another oceanic plate, this occurs. The process in which a denser plate is pushed downward beneath a less dense plate when a plate converge occurs at the continental to the oceanic boundaries and the oceanic boundaries to oceanic boundaries. The ocean trench. Deep and narrow depressions in the seafloor where the subducted plate moves into the atmosphere. That's the trench right here. And you can see what's happening there. Convergent boundaries with mountain building. And you'll learn a little bit more about that mountain build building later on in your virtual field trip today. We have here the continental plate, which is going that direction, moving in that direction. And then the continental plate also moving in this direction. And then we have what we call the convergent boundary. And that's happening right in here. A major geological event occurs when continental plates of equal density converge. A transform boundary, the boundary between two plates that slide past one another, sudden shifts that result in major geological events such as earthquakes, which will be covered later on in this lesson. The supercontinent containing all continental land masses join together. Where two or more plates meet, that is called a boundary. And as you can see, we have the Australian plate here, the Eurasian plate, the plate, the Pacific plate, the North American plate, 
the Nazca plate, the South American plate, the African plate, and the Eurasian plate. So there are a variety of plates that make up, uh, that have boundary lines that make up uh, the tectonic plates that exist on our planet. Landform created at a transformed boundary such as the Andre San Andreas Fault in California. Those are fault lines that separate plates. The Rift Valley, landform created at a divergent boundary on the continental crust such as the Great African Rift Valley. Now, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen with you guys and I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Gorman. So if any of you have any questions about what used to be a theory, but now it is fact because the evidence truly supports plate tectonics. Okay, Dr. Thank you, Mr. Monroe. Question is, what causes the tectonic plates to move? A brief description. The heat from radioactive processes within the planet's interior causes the plates to move, sometimes towards and sometimes away from each other. This movement is called plate motion or tectonic shift. Thank you again, Mr. Monroe. And now we're going to let Ms. Ramirez tell us about earthquakes. Hello, my name is Ms. Ramirez, and in this segment, we're going to be learning about earthquakes and how they relate to plate tectonics. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you guys so we can start our presentation. Uh, when I start the presentation, you'll notice the video will start playing. The video is just showing you guys uh, some earthquakes from around the world. Uh, so let me get that presentation started. Uh, I do have some essential questions for you guys as you are paying attention to that video. Uh, hopefully by the end of this segment, you guys will be able to answer these two questions. The first question is, what causes earthquakes and what are two effects of earthquakes? The second question is, you should be able to name and describe the three kinds of faults. Uh, so keep those two questions in mind as we go through the presentation today. And hopefully you guys were able to watch um, a little bit of this video, but it really does show some of the devastating effects of earthquakes. You can see the damage it does to buildings. Um, to the roads, the infrastructure of a city, as well as to how it can hurt people, um, causing injuries and even death as well. Uh, so let's go to our next slide. Uh, we're going to relate these earthquakes to plate tectonics. So essentially, earthquakes are just ground movements that occur when blocks of rock in earth move suddenly and release energy. This energy is released in seismic waves, which cause the ground to shake and tremble, as you guys saw in that video. So think about where do you think you will find the most earthquakes and why? So take a look at this map, uh, make your predictions, and I'm going to take you guys to a website called Seismic Explorer, um, and we're going to examine and observe where these earthquakes are occurring. So let me get out of this and we'll go to our website. Let me move some of my controls around really quick. Um, so this is Seismic Explorer um, and make some observations. Notice the names of the plates. Notice where the plate boundaries are. Notice the motion or the movement of those plate boundaries. And you can use this key over here on the right to help you guys. When I play the simulation, if there's an earthquake, it will be represented by a dot. The bigger the dot, the higher the magnitude earthquake. So the higher the magnitude or that number, the more destructive that earthquake is. It's also color coded uh, by depth. So um, whether it's a shallow earthquake or whether it occurs deeper in earth. And then you can also see the plate boundaries are represented as well, as well as their motion. So I'm gonna go ahead and start the simulation. Again, make some observations. And again, where do you think most earthquakes are going to occur? So right away to me, it becomes rather obvious. Uh, most earthquakes are going to occur along those uh, plate tectonic boundaries. So as plates are moving, pressure builds up near the edges of those plates, and these movements are breaking Earth's crust into a series of faults. And again, a fault is just a break in Earth's crust along which blocks of rock move, uh, thus causing those earthquakes. So most earthquakes are going to occur along um, plate boundaries, but again, you can notice not all of them do. There are a few earthquakes 
uh, that will happen uh, not along a plate boundary as you can see here in this map. Uh, so I'm gonna put us back on our presentation. And again, you can see most earthquakes will occur at or near plate boundaries. And then uh, just to review, since this is one of your questions, an earthquake is what happens when two blocks of earth suddenly slip past one another. The surface where they slip is called the fault or fault plane. Now let's take a look at this infographic that shows different types of plate boundaries. Um, so you might be familiar with these plate boundaries. You saw these names uh, when we were looking at that simulation. So take a moment to compare and contrast the different plate boundaries. What do you guys notice um, about each of these? And again, feel free to pause the video to allow for discussion time, but I'm just gonna go ahead and start explaining it. Uh, so if we take a look at divergent boundaries, uh, so divergent means to pull apart and you can see from these arrows, they're moving away from each other. At divergent boundaries, plates are being pulled apart, causing the crust to stretch. Uh, this stretching causes stress, which we call tension. Um, so it's stretching the rock and it's making that rock thinner. Um, here at divergent boundaries, we commonly have normal faults and uh, normal faults will cause earthquakes, but they're usually more shallow earthquakes. Now take a look at convergent. Notice the direction of those areas. Convergent means to come together. Uh, so at convergent boundaries, uh, plates are colliding into one another, causing rocks to be squeezed. Uh, this squeezing is called compression. And at uh, convergent boundaries, we typically see reverse faults. And usually at reverse faults, these are going to be um, your deeper earthquakes, and they're going to be your more destructive ones. And then take a look at your transform boundaries. It's where two tectonic plates slide uh, past one another horizontally, and it is creating stress called shear stress. So essentially, as those plates are moving past one another, um, they are shearing or being broken as they grind past each other. This is creating strike slip faults. Um, and a common example would be the um, San Andreas fault. Um, so there's, those are some of the three types of plate boundaries and the faults associated with them. Now take a look, a uh, closer look at those three faults that we just went over briefly. Compare and contrast the three different faults that you see here. Uh, notice the movement and also notice how they're impacting uh, the houses, the trees and uh, the landscape around them. Um, so go ahead and take a moment if you would like to make those observations. Uh, again, you can pause the video if you would like, but I'm going to show you guys a quick little video that goes into detail about each of these three faults. So here's our video. Hopefully our audio will play and it's just super In a short. normal fault, the block above the fault, called the hanging wall, moves down relative to the block below the fault, called the foot wall. This fault motion is caused by tensional forces and results in extension. In a reverse fault, the hanging wall moves up relative to the foot wall. This motion is caused by compressional forces and results in overall shortening. A strike slip fault is a near vertical fracture where the ground has shifted parallel to Earth's surface due to horizontal shearing forces. If you stand on one side of the fault and the block opposite you shifts left, it is called a left lateral fault. If it moves right, it's a right lateral fault. So I'm gonna go ahead, hopefully that uh, quick video was able to introduce you to those three types of faults. Our next one um, that we're gonna take a look at is an earthquake interactive map from the United States Geological Society. This one is really cool because it shows you uh, real time uh, earthquakes that are occurring around the world. So here's the key for this website. Uh, you can see the bigger the dot, the bigger the magnitude or the more destructive it is. And the color code tells us if it happened within the last hour or within the last day or week. Um, and you can see right over here, the one in New Mexico is a red dot. That just happened during our break. Um, so it's pretty fascinating to see that around the world, earthquakes are uh, commonly occurring and we're not often aware of that. Uh, so again, that's a cool interactive map from the United States Geological Society. Uh, so let's go back to our presentation. Um, and just some quick words uh, regarding earthquakes. Uh, so earthquake waves can be uh, tracked to a point below the Earth's surface known as the focus. 
Now we also might call it the hypocenter. So just be aware that the hypocenter and the focus are the same thing. So the focus is a place within earth along, at, along a fault at which the first motion of a quake occurs. Then we have what's called the epicenter, which we mostly hear a lot about. And an epicenter is the spot directly above the focus on Earth's surface. Um, and again, that's the epicenter. And seismic waves flow outward from uh, the epicenter in all directions. So you can see a map here. The epicenter, again, is the point on the surface of the Earth. And the hypocenter, or the focus, is the point uh, below within the Earth. And then you can take a moment, if you would like, uh, to compare and contrast the various wave motions and the effects they have. So not all waves, earthquake waves, travel the same. So this is a good little diagram that explains the various uh, wave motions and how those different waves impact uh, the land, houses, roads, and things like that. And I have a reflection question for you guys. Think about why is it important to study plate tectonics and then what are other effects of earthquakes? Uh, so some other effects of earthquakes other than the, the ground shaking would be uh, landslides and tsunamis. Uh, so in 2008, China experienced a really bad landslide and you can see that result here. And then of course, um, Japan in 2011 had that horrible tsunami uh, caused from an earthquake, um, and uh, unfortunately a lot of people died from that. Uh, so earthquakes can cause some devastating damage, and even here in Texas we have earthquakes. So back in 2015 there was a lot of earthquakes in north central Texas, um, and here are some pictures taken from Irving residents, and you can see the damage it caused to their ceilings and their floor and the foundation of their homes. Uh, so yes, even here in Texas we can be impacted by earthquakes. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and stop our screen share. And that's all I have for you guys today on earthquakes. We're going to give it back to Dr. Borman to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Maris. The question was, what is the strongest earthquake ever recorded? Uh, Valdiva, Chile, recorded an earthquake of 9.5 on the Richter scale. Two million people were left homeless. 1,655 people died. And now we're gonna let Miss Nash tell us about volcanoes. Welcome to my classroom. Sadly, we can't take a trip to a real volcano or maybe not such a bad thing because sometimes that can be really dangerous, but I made a volcano just for us. So let's see if it's working today. So a volcano can be a lovely tourist attraction or death trap, depending on what happens. So since we can't take a trip to a real volcano, we're going to be doing a little virtual trip around the world to see what is a volcano, where are they? Let me share my screen here and we'll see what we can see. Okay, so what is a volcano? You've probably all seen diagrams like this. Okay, so magma from under the earth where it's very, very hot, actually hot, can sometimes appear on the surface of the planet. And it can come out as lava, as, as gas, ash, or what we call a pyroclastic flow. The part where it comes out is called the crater. And most of these volcanoes form along places where the giant plates, the tectonic plates are either diverging or converging. There are other kinds of places they form also. We'll talk about that in a minute. So famously, we have what we call the ring of fire. So there's the Pacific Ocean in the middle. You see Hawaii in the middle. And around that area is where the plates are crashing into each other. Plate. And we have lots and lots of volcanoes. So you can see how the, the uh, islands off the coast of Alaska, all the way down the coast of North America, Central America, down South America, and then all around on the other side along Asia, and of course, uh, Japan, and all those other places also have lots and lots of volcanoes. Hawaii is out in the middle of that ocean, not anywhere near the plate. 
where it's crashing into another place. But in fact, it's a really interesting place called the hot spot. And in fact, Mauna Loa in Hawaii is the world's largest volcano. It's formed over a place where the plates are either thinning or stretching. Mexico also has lots and lots of volcanoes. And again, because it's on that edge of that ring of fire, what they call the ring of fire. So most volcanoes are actually forming underwater. And these are some pic amazing pictures of where gases are forming and lava's coming up. And even finally, coming out above the surface of the water. This is how the Hawaiian islands are formed, and lots of other islands, also volcanic islands in the ocean, formed from volcanoes that came up to the surface and are now an island. In some places where the, the vents are, um, weird gases and things are escaping, and really interesting little ecosystems form around the gases, okay? So it's interesting to, to investigate. Here's some islands that have emerged from under, under the water. You can see they're still pretty active. And as more and more ash and lava comes up, an island, the island will go larger and larger. You may have heard recently, just a year or so ago, there was a terrible disaster in New Zealand. There was this um, called White Island, and it was a tourist attraction. There was a volcano, and people would go visit the volcano. and. There were some warning signs that maybe something was about to happen, something bad was about to happen. But of course, since they all wanted to make money, they kept on going. And in fact, more than 50 people died from a kind of surprise, not a big surprise, but they said it was a surprise. They were caught by surprise and they died. So be careful. We have three kinds of volcanoes. And the ones we think about, like my little model here, what we call a cone volcano, the little perfect cone. And here's an example. There's a famous one um, from Costa Rica called Arenal, okay, the perfect cinder cone. The other two kinds are called shield volcanoes and strato volcanoes. So Mauna Loa in Hawaii is a shield volcano. I think it was shield that someone would carry, kind of flatter. So you can see on the left-hand side that snow-covered peak, okay, actually it's even in Hawaii, it's so high that snow is on top. Very, very flat and huge. The whole island is, the, is volcanic. So it comes up 55,770 feet or 17,000 meters from the sea floor, taller than Mount Everest, okay, if you measure from the bottom. It's 13,691 feet or 4,170 meters above sea level. So it's a really high mountain. Shield volcanoes are not generally explosive. The lava comes relatively slowly. People have time to get out of the way, although it can also cause a lot of trouble if your house happens to be in the wake, in the path of the volcano, volcanic flow, it'll just burn up. And also it's really, covers up roads and things. If you ever have a chance to go visit Hawaii, go to see the volcanoes. There's a volcano national park where you can walk across the around in the old volcano. It's the world's largest volcano and one of the most active. It's almost constantly having some level of activity. And these volcanoes of Hawaii, the Hawaiian islands formed over the hot spot and the, the plate it's moving. So as it moves, the hot spot changes spots. So the older the older islands are no longer active volcanoes. So it's really interesting. Hawaii is amazing. Here's a really dangerous kind called stratovolcanoes, like Mount St. Helens in Washington. This is the most dangerous kind. They're very large and they can explode from the side, as well as the wreck. So the eruption in 1980 of Mount St. Helens, that's the picture of it right there, ash hundreds of miles up into the air. And it was, it was a, what was called the pyroclastic flow. So it's lava mixed with gases and ash, and it killed 57 people. There's a car buried in it. 
and also level a forest all around. And of course, all the animals and birds and everything else died. Here's another stratovolcano at Mount Edna in Italy, it has four distinct craters. And a lot of people live around these, uh, these volcanoes because the, the soil tends to be very rich and fertile. So it's a good place to be a farmer, except when the volcano explodes. So Popocatepetl near Mexico City is another stratovolcano, snow on top, you see it, smoke coming out from lava. Um, the name means smoking mountain in Aztec, Mount St. Helens and Popocatepetl are all in the Pacific Ring of Fire where convergent plates are coming together. So Iceland's volcanoes form over a divergent mountain. So Iceland is famous for all the hot springs and, and geothermal energy, but, and also the volcanoes. So lots and lots of volcanoes. So there, that mid -Ocean, Ocean Ridge is above sea level. Sadly, we have no, well, maybe not sadly, but we have no active volcanoes in Texas. There are some extinct ones. Here's a big shield volcano out in central Texas and some, some long gone volcanoes in West Texas. So if you want to see a volcano, you'll have to go somewhere else. So thank you for your attention. And volcanoes are really interesting. And you can find lots of amazing information and pictures on the Thank you, Ms. Nash. Uh, I think Ms. Nash pretty well covered this question, but it came in, so I'll make sure the student gets the answer. What is the most destructive volcano in U.S. history? And it was Mount St. Helens, May the 18th, 1980. Uh, now, it did have a small eruption or carrying on the day before, and it gave people a uh, warning to get out of there, but it hadn't done anything in a long time, so people... A lot of people stayed. 57 people were killed. Thousands of animals were killed. And the trees were destroyed for 200 square miles. And now Ms. Fuller is going to tell us about mountain building. Good morning, boys and girls. We're going to be talking about orogeny, mountain building caused by the movement of tectonic plates. Now, this is granite. Uh, the crustal plates the, um, are made of different things. The oceanic plates are basaltic, which is a very dense material, and the continental plates are thicker and made of granite. Sometimes it's called uh, basement rock. So let's go ahead and share the screen. And we're going to be talking about orogeny, mountain building. Let's see here. All right, plate tectonics and mountain building. And in the background, you see a, a very, very famous mountain. It's called uh, Long's Peak. It's in the uh, Colorado Rocky Mountains. And we're going to be talking about the a uh, laramide tectonic orogeny that happened about 70 million years ago. So let's look at our two essential questions that we're gonna be thinking about as we go through the program. Number one, what's the science word for mountain building? I've already said it twice and we're gonna say it a few more times. And number two, can you name a mountain range formed by the movement of tectonic plates? I'll give you a hint. The mountain range that you're looking at right now, the Himalayas or the Himalayan, depending on how you pronounce it, um, they are uh, caused by convergent uh, movement of tectonic plates. So let's go ahead and look at that. The formation of the Himalayan mountains. Now this is not narrated, it just has real exciting music, but what the, it's only one minute long and it's gonna show you how that the Indian subcontinent, the uh, Indian plate is going to move into, uh, leave Pangea, move into, the uh, Eurasian plate and cause the formation, the orogeny of the Himalayan uh, mountain range. So here we go. This 
moving your heart. Come to the end of your plate. Gonna mash into the Eurasian plate. And there form the Hamayan mountain range. Remember, this is convergent. Those two plates came together. They converged. It's down there. Really. Okay, that's pretty exciting music we have there. And we're going to move on to a different kind of orogeny. We're going to talk now about the kind of orogeny for, for, for divergent. A, a, where the plates move apart. And orogeny is mountain building where block mountains form uh, by the pushing of tectonic plates against one another. Well, that would be convergent actually. And we've got, this occurs like Ms. Ramirez pointed out to you at a place where there are normal faults. Now, um, the, the part that bulges upward is called horst. That's a Dutch and German word that means heap. So you can tell it kind of looks like a heap. And then the one that goes down is called a graben, and that's a Dutch and a German word that means dig. So the horse uh, part forms up and forms a heap, and the graben part looks like it's been dug out. All right, so let's go to the next one. Now let's talk about subduction. Subduction is when two tectonic plates push into one another, one of the plates goes under or subducts the other. And it, it, it's pushing on one of the plates and then going down. Now, generally, that plate will go deep into the asthenosphere and um, be absorbed. But in the case of the Rocky Mountains, it's different. So look at this diagram right here, and it shows you the, the Pacific Ocean, it shows you the oceanic crust, uh, subducting the North American uh, plate. And there we've got the Rocky Mountains, but that's really not where the Rocky Mountains are. They are not on the edge of the plate. So how did this happen? Because most mountain building with um, uh, convergent plates will happen on the edge, but the Rocky Mountains are a thousand miles from California. So what, what caused this? So we're going to look at a short little video that's going to explain this, how the Rocky Mountains formed a thousand miles from the plate boundaries. And I'm going to move it in just a little bit. I'm going to get rid of the ad first. Mountains usually form close to plate boundaries, but the southern Rockies sit a long way from the plate margin. The Front Range in Colorado is a thousand miles from where the Pacific and North American plates actually meet. Geologists have come up with an explanation. They believe that the subducting Pacific Ocean plate is responsible. Ocean crust had been pushed deep into the mantle beneath North America for a hundred million years when something unusual happened. Plate started to subduct at a shallower angle. Instead of plummeting steeply, it sliced beneath North America horizontally. This change had dramatic consequences. The big oceanic plate in the Pacific didn't go deep down, it went in shallow like a spatula under a pizza. So something happened 68 million years ago over in California, that plate drives under North America, but instead of diving deeply, it comes in shallow and a thousand miles away from the coast, up from the ground sprout the Rocky Mountains. For millions of years, the ocean plate scraped along the underside of North America. It created friction, breaking up the basement granite of the North American plate and punching it upward. All right, so that, that describes 
what happened to for, for the formation of the Rocky Mountains. Now, the Rocky Mountains formed during what's called the Laramide orogeny, the Laramide mountain building process. Remember, the word uh, for mountain building is orogeny. And that's when these um, uh, Rocky Mountains formed uh, 70 to 40 million years ago. It was a long time. Now, remember, the narrator told you that the oceanic crust had been subducting the western edge of the North American crust for hundreds of millions of years. It wasn't until it changed the trajectory going from a deep dive to a very shallow dive and scraping the bottom of that basement rock and pushing those rocks up. And it, it formed tremendous mountains. Some of these mountains are 14,000 feet tall. Now, what about the Guadalupe Mountains? Now, the Himalayans and the Rocky Mountains are very definitely uh, caused by movement or convergence of uh, tectonic plates. There is some tectonic movement for our mountains, the Guadalupe Mountains, the ones in West Texas, but they aren't considered technically a tectonic mountain formation. But there was something that happened. Uh, there were two major events, one that happened about 80 million years ago, and then one that happened about 20 million years ago, that the 180 million years ago uplifted the area where we live now, Texas, it wasn't Texas then. And so it uplifted that. And then the one about 20 million years ago, it, it caused the area uh, where the Guadalupe Mountains are now to, to rise up. And that had been a very, very prolific uh, uh, sea. And uh, it was full of um, limestone and fossils. I don't really have time to show you the uh, video for that. I've run out of time. But uh, let's, let's just say when you go to uh, see Guadalupe Peak and go see El Capitan, it's full of fossils because it used to be deep under the ocean. Uh, if you have any other questions, I'm gonna stop sharing. If you have any questions about orogeny mountain building and uh, or anything along those lines, uh, Dr. Gorman will be more than happy to help you. Thank you, good day. Thank you, Ms. Fuller. I had a couple of questions. What is the tallest mountain on earth? Um, I'm thinking during her presentation, she probably covered this, but uh, Mount Everest uh, between Nepal and T Tibet is 29,029 feet. And what is the tallest mountain in the United States? Uh, Denali in Alaska, 20,308 feet. Uh, and Denali was lifted just as he explained the Rocky Mountains. It was lifted by tectonic pressure from subduction of the Pacific plate beneath the North American plate. Thank you again, Ms. Fuller. Thank you, uh, Rosemont, for joining us today. Now I am going to share my screen. During this virtual field trip, students explored plate tectonics. Students identified the major tectonic plates and described how plate tectonics causes major geological events such as ocean basin formation, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, and mountain building. Mr. Monroe introduced you to plate tectonics. Ms. Ramirez covered earthquakes. Ms. Nash covered volcanoes. And Ms. Fuller did uh, mountain building. Thank you, teachers. How did we do? If you would, please go to www.tiny.cc slash CEC feedback, fill out a short form and send it back to us. Thank you. Have a great day. Most importantly, have a great life.